Well, it's over to you. I'm going to shut up. And um, thanks. All right, please. let's kick things off. <clears throat> so, if you walk away tonight with just one thing in your mind, and that is to support tears, then mm. I am happy. So they do great work with dogs and cats and all other kinds of animals that are really in need of help. So that is it. So if, if that's all you're here for, by the way, then thank you very much for coming. Have a good evening and see you later. Let's move on. Just, just thank you. <laughs> so so thank, thank you for the opportunity to bore you a little bit with some of the nerdy stuff that I do. So I, once upon a time, a few weeks ago, wrote a little article that kind of went viral. And, ooh, let me just move the screen out of the way. Kind of went viral. And then Cornel asked me if I wanted to do a talk at the Josie Jug. And I haven't made an ass of myself in quite a while. So I thought, hey, why not? Let's do it. So what are we going to do tonight? We're going to have a little bit of a chat around what Compose is, why, you, why you, you should care, why it's been developed, where it's come from, and what I think is something that, there are some tips and tricks that you need to keep in mind when you think about this new technology. If you have any questions, Cornel will Google them and he will get back to you. Um, I don't have slides. I, I don't have slides. What I have is I have this weird app that does all kinds of funny things as we go along. Um, to demonstrate some of the things that you shouldn't do in a desktop app with Compose, but that you can. So now that we've covered that, let's move on. And let's get right into some of the technical stuff. So for the people that are not technical, sorry, the following five to eight minutes, you can catch a nap. I'll let you know when it's over and then we'll move on to stuff that's a little bit less nerdy. First of all, what is Compose? So Anybody that's watching this are familiar with desktop applications. I mean, you've got, you've got your, your email client or your word processing client or something like that. And yes, there's been a big move towards web apps, but there's still a lot of desktop applications that we use. So Compose is a way to create the user interfaces for these desktop apps. And there's some comparisons you can draw between Compose and Flutter or Swift UI or things like that. Um, there's subtle differences as well. Um, with Swift UI, I think it's the closest that you can get to Compose because it's built specifically for, 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 for the Apple operating systems. And it's very close to the metal. Unlike Flutter, Flutter, which is a phenomenal toolkit, which I really love, is built on an abstraction layer on top of a lot of abstraction layers, which means that you end up not being close to the metal. And for developers, when it comes to high performance applications, that can be a little bit of a challenge. And the other thing is, if you go any other direction than Compose, um, and I know there's Swing and I know there's Java FX, but they, they, they have the, their own challenges. But with Compose, if you go the Compose route, you still have the entire Java ecosystem. Um, that's 20 plus years old, it's mature, it's powerful, it's integrated into everything. So as a developer, especially if you're a Java or Kotlin or Scala developer, using Compose gives you the, the benefit of having this fancy new user interface but it also gives you the comfort of being able to do things the way you've always done them because they work and you don't have to change your entire paradigm to support this new user interface technology. As a designer, it means that developers have less excuses. So previously, it was easy to tell a designer, no, thank you, I'm not going to build the desktop app that way because it's too much work or we just can't do it. Now, it's a little bit more difficult to push against good designs because it's actually plausible to, to implement that in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And anybody else shouldn't care about this. Really, this is just, this is just for, for, for the people that, that do all the implementation stuff. So what does Compose do? Compose allows you to take a whole bunch of things like little Lego blocks, stack them together and come up with a really cool UI. So 
just want to run through some of the code that I've got here just to show you what Compose looks like and how it works. So there's an annotation, Composable. If you don't know what annotations is, don't worry about it. We create a little window, we give it a title, we give it a size, and you can see here that there's a little window, right? And the next thing that's interesting in Compose is because you are building something that is reactive, in other words, it, it reacts to changes, you can tell it, I want you to remember a value that can change and I want you to start at zero. So this value count is now going to be remembered by this composable, which is the component that gets rendered. And when that changes, it is going to redraw itself. Now that's a, that's a bit of a paradigm shift because if you come from something like Swing or JavaFX, it was a lot more work to get this kind of thing to happen where you want the user interface to just update by itself as things change. It was, it was a lot more work than just a one-liner. So it's, it's definitely doable, but what I like about Compose is just simpler. I don't have to think so much about observables and fades and all of that kind of thing. So I can pick a theme. In this case, I just picked material theme. You can stack things in a column with a little bit of spacing between. I don't want to dig into that too much, but here you've got a button. So there's a button and there's a button. And the Hello World button has got an on-click event. And that click event takes the value that we've remembered up here and it adds one to the value. And that's all it does. It doesn't do anything else. So then we've got the text on the button that says, if the value is zero, say hello world, otherwise say how many times we've clicked. We've got another button and this button resets the value to zero and it's got text reset. So that's our two buttons. So if I click on hello world once, a few things happen. First of all, you'll see that that zero changed to one. So the state of this composable changed. That caused it to redraw the screen. It redrew it and it went through all of this and got here and it said, wait a minute, the text is no longer zero. So I have to change the text to how many times I've clicked. And if I click again, you'll see it becomes a two and a three and a four and a five. And notice as I click on it, there's this cool little effect to show the user that, hey, I clicked on it. That's built in. You don't have to work hard for that. Now notice when I press reset, everything goes back to zero. And the moment it goes back to zero, it re-renders itself into the state that's represented by that zero. So, and this is just something that we can just do some stuff on the fly. But the bottom line here is that we can go and set up a composable and as a value changes, this re-renders itself, which is really, really cool. So you don't have to work too hard to get all of this to happen. Next thing, now that we know that a composable will re-render itself when, when an observed value changes, we can start using that to do something. For those that are impatient, the source code for the, for the bouncing application is here with all the little skeleton stuff around it to make it work and everything. I'm just going to cover some of the, of the more technical stuff here. So notice that we've got four circles being drawn on the screen with four positions. Now, if we slap them around a little bit, we'll see that the positions change. And all that this does is it changes the values here. And immediately this re-renders itself with the new positions. Now, that's something we can use because we now see that everything here updates instantly when we change the values, all right? So what can we do with that information? What we can do if we want to is we can be a little bit sneaky and we can say, we know that Compose renders around 60 times per second. So it refreshes the screen around 60 times per second. There's frames 60 times per second. We can patch into that and say, let me know whenever there's a new frame being requested because I want to do some stuff as well. And what we can do at that point in time is we can change the position of these circles by a small increment at a time. And if we do that in a small enough increment, it looks like they are moving. And we did all of this without thread management, 
without all of that funny stuff that we would have had to do in the past. We just say, let me know when you are refreshing and I want to tap into that and I want to do some stuff. So there's the source code. If anyone wants to go look at it, on the next screen, we put all of this together. And here we've got a whole bunch of them up and running. And what happens is when we draw the balloons, this gets called on every frame request. When we draw the balloons, go to the canvas, we say for each balloon, update the position and then redraw it. And this happens in the background without me doing anything else. I don't have to think about what I'm doing. I've just told Compose that, hey, watch these values and when they change, go ahead, update. All right. So why would you want to do stuff like this? And now, now we're going to jump out of the technical stuff again. So why would you want to do something like this? What's the point of that? As a freelance developer, I'm always trying to solve various problems for my clients. And even though I'm mostly in the mobile space, a lot of the time, some of the problems that I try to solve do not necessarily make sense to solve as a mobile app. For example, working for, for a company called Neurocast at the moment where they do a, a, a keyboard for people with MS to monitor and track their health, health status. And there's a lot of testing that needs to happen around how this works. And it doesn't make sense to build that as a mobile app. So we built a desktop app in Compose that has a whole bunch of features that allow us, just gonna move this out of the way, that allow us to test the application and observe the application while it's being used by a user without them even knowing about it. One of the things that, that I like about Compose is I can go and build something like this little, little satellite view of, of South Africa. And this is about 15 minutes worth of work, if that much, to get this user interface to work where I've got a longitude latitude. It's got a zoom function. It's got some observables that it's got in there, some, sensor, some sensors that are in there. And all of this kind of thing, it's quick, easy, and simple to mock up something like this, get it up and running, and get it production ready. So the advantage to something I compose is because it's easier and faster to do things like this, you can build more ambitious user interfaces. So you can have your designers think about what is a good user experience? What would be a good way to represent information or data to a client or to an end user without having the restrictions of what the underlying platform or toolkit can do? Because you can make your own components that allow you to do small little things that add value. So, I mean, literally, this was like 15 minutes to do this. But if you spend some time, you can actually make something that's really, really cool. All right, so these are some actual components that I've built, and I want to show you something interesting. Most of these components have some kind of an action happening to them. I did not do any fade management. I didn't have to do any fades that run or anything like that. All of this is built in to compose. So all of these, all of these effects, all of, all of these state transitions, all of that, these things built into Compose. And even though there's a whole bunch of things happening on the screen, which I, am, I, I did not coordinate or synchronize at all, the user interface stays responsive. So what happens in the background is when you tell Compose to do a whole bunch of things, you've got coroutines, cotton coroutines, which is like lightweight threads that you can kick off. And what they do is they keep running in the background without interfering with the user interface. So you are free to just focus on what you are building and you don't have to worry like in the past with how do I keep the screen updated? How do I keep it from getting new information and refreshing itself all the time? Now you no longer have to go through that whole exercise. Um, I'm kind of rushing because I don't know how, how long we're gonna have power for. So that was, that was the, essence of the talk, just quick. I wanna to get to questions because I'm sure there's gonna be a few questions. Cornel? Uh, wow, <laughs> I'm really impressed. Um, so 
My first question would be is obviously Compose for Desktop is still pretty new. Um, did you experience any pain um, in the process or um, um, are they basically building from the ground up and adding the fancy stuff later if you compare it to because i assume you've used compose in, in um on android as well yes um how would so how would you compare the two in terms of maturity and um uh what's the same what's different um how easy is it going to be to build some um uh, something where you can at least share part of it between the two platforms because i know they're also working on compose for web um which i think is is um lagging behind the others um because there's obviously a few more challenges to solve there mm. um yeah so that's the many questions <laughs> okay i'll try i'll try i'll try to address them first of all compose on android is production ready so yeah. it's <clears throat> I've used it in production. I'm very happy with it. The tooling support is awesome. So from that point of view, Compose is mature. Compose for mm -hmm. desktop is still alpha. There's mm -hmm. a lot of challenges with it. There's a lot of problems with video playing and all kinds of things that, that, are, that are just uh -huh. not really cool. They are making rapid progress though. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. from, from where it was to where it is now, in, within a couple of months, it has gone mm -hmm. from horrible to, okay, we need to start taking this serious. Uh -huh. What okay. they have worked on very, very hard is the ability to embed swing. Yes, because uh, that, I, I, I that was going to be one of my next questions is um, how far away are you from swing or from um, Java FX? Um, and um, I had a brief look and I saw that um, uh, it looks like it's fairly easy to bring a swing in and the same goes for Java FX as well. Yes. So that means that if you have an investment in swing, uh, you don't have to chuck it all. Yes. Um, you can still bring it in, which obviously brings uh, some of your existing stuff um, along and preserves that. That is, that is, that is a massive advantage because a lot of yeah, the work yeah. that I do is take Java apps, port them to Kotlin. Mm -hmm. So in, in that same instance, we can port all the swing functionality and start slowly replacing it with compose mm -hmm. functionality mm -hmm. where, it, where it's stable enough and where it makes sense to do that. Yes, yes. So, so on, on, on the desktop, I think it's, it's light years ahead of where web is. Web is still a little bit yeah. brittle. Mm -hmm. There are some, some, some projects in the samples where they are sharing code between the three platforms. Mm -hmm. um, someone today released a um, Kotlin native build of Compose as well, which if you want to blow up your machine, go ahead and try it. <laughs> but, but it's, it's very raw. It's very rough. I can imagine. But, but I love so what, it. So, so, so what are they using under the hood in native? Op OpenGL. OpenGL play. Because Open Skia, remember, it's all built yeah. on Skia. So, yeah. so, so you have Skia in the, in, in, in the background that does all the rendering and stuff, which does okay, really that's what, for, for Chrome. That's what and, Flutter uses underneath as well. Right? Yes, exactly. Ah, okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes. So, so I think there's going to be rapid movement because yeah. Skia is so enormously mature and powerful. Yes, yes. So, 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 so yes. So, so the thing is they have a stable language. They have a stable... Um, uh, platform in the sense of uh, what coroutines offers mm -hmm. and they have skia which is stable which then allows them obviously um to to iterate uh, relatively quickly and the yes. result is going to be um, it could just be mind-blowing because most of the other toolkits are actually if you compare what you can do um uh, um, it's light years ahead. Um, I love that they just go, well, oh, let materials. So now you've got the, um, uh, um, oh, what do they call that, that thing in material where the button, um, uh, uh, um, uh, sort of flutters or waves or. Oh, oh, some, yeah. oh there's uh, ripples and all that kind ripple, of stuff. Ripple, yeah, the ripple. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so that's COVID brain. I, I've got an excuse. Uh, it's not my age. Um, <laughs> it's really powerful stuff. And, and what I love it's, about Yeah, it's it. awesome. And the thing is, it's, it's like you... So it really allows you to move to a declarative UI, which is what I've always been um, trying to attain to some extent with whatever I do, is to, is to get some form of declarative process going so that um, you get consistency because without that uh, you can quickly get a mess um, mm. you would mm. know from um, if you try and do low level swing stuff and um, multi-threaded and you forget to run it in the right thread then yes exactly it's going to blow up in the in the demo it's not going to blow up while you're debugging or testing we all know that um so no i mean i've come through i've bought my first applets in awt yes to do uh, uh um this was a uh forex um uh, uh order management and um the people could see a live view the app i basically split the screen i had a um applet in the top half and a frame in the bottom half with um, uh, with a table and the applet actually refreshed the HTML table. Oh yes, yes. And it had graphs and all, and this was in um, in um, 98, 99. And that was when, when running, applets were still cool, right? Yes, and I, I had three and a half thousand people use this app um, uh, uh, um, running on a single Tomcat server. Oh, wow. And um, we basically, I used like a slow pull to do the updates. Um, and um, I had to jump through some hoops to get the Tomcat to not fall over, but we just chucked some memory at it and it, and it and ran. So, um, and yet, if you think about it, we're not that far from what we were then today. Nothing, um, nothing is yeah, changed. We've got web sockets and we've got all kinds of other stuff, but the basic abstraction hasn't improved. No. Um, it's still too difficult to do things that that doesn't look like buttons and input boxes and things like that. But mm. this is for me, so for me, this is a game changer. I'm really excited because um, I can see that I can, it's, it's, it's easy to build interesting components obviously um if you're a psycho about it you, you you're going to frustrate your users yeah. um, which is important but i liked your, your your option where you said um what does this mean for ux because it means that you can now really ask what do we want to achieve what do we want to um uh, to have the user experience and the bottom line is you want to show him something, you want to give them something to interact with, and you want to give them feedback. And if you have a responsive um, UI, you can do that. And if you have a platform that makes it easy to build things like that, then you can do wonderful UIs that remain intuitive, that's not weird and wonky, because I've seen, oh, I mean, weird and wonky, um, even today, um, people have, if you look at Android and, and, and iOS, incredible platforms, and then people go and do silly, yes, silly, silly things when um, you think, who are they trying to impress? Ah, the guy sitting next to them or themselves. Yes, yes. yes. No, try and impress your user by making them happy. Don't give them bad surprises. What's, um, what's cool is is I work with um, I can't name the client, but I work with with a big client that have it's a big corporate client, and they've they've mm -hmm. got a very strong UX team. And mm -hmm. what we do is we sit and work, and I've got a UX person sitting right next to me, saying, oh, okay. "I want you to do this. I want you to do that. Move this here. Mm -hmm. Make this round. Make this make this a graphic that runs like this." So they sketch it. Mm -hmm. I do it because mm -hmm. it supports SVG style development so every, everything everything is a vector so oh, okay. so i can i can implement what they are 
having in their head and the sketch mm. that they give me, mm. we put mm. it on the screen and we, we literally just have it on the screen and it's there. And yeah. we just work yeah. with it. Yeah. So, so and when we can immediately test it and say, yeah, hey, this is amazing. Or, yeah. you know what, this actually doesn't translate so well from paper to actual implementation. Exactly. Yes. We, don't, we don't like it. It, it looks cool yeah. and it looks cool, but it's cumbersome to use. Yeah. And the, the, the amount of development overhead that's cut out is astonishing because yes, the user experience yes. person sits next to me and sees it immediately and goes like, oh, no, I don't like that font on the screen now. Yeah. Exactly. It yeah, it's not, else. yeah, you don't have to wait two weeks until you, you get no. that feedback. No. And um, yeah, but if I think back, I mean, in literally in, in 1991, um, when I first started playing with graphic stuff that was not Windows, um, that's what we were doing. We were literally um Borland had a, a part of that was a nice graphics toolkit and you could do weird stuff and we like were PGI and stuff yeah yeah and we we were doing that and i i then built a layer to do that on an embedded device with a um lcd display it was just black and white but the the user loved it and it was usable yeah. And um, that was so much fun. And it was all taken away by um, a little thin book called Common User Access. I don't know oh, if you remember that yes, little book. Yes, yes. Now, look, it brought some sanity to what was user interactions, but it took away a lot of the, of the fun. Yes. And um, yeah. now people are trying to go back there, but they don't always have the tools. But now we've got the... Um, uh, the tools again. So I'm I'm really excited by. Oh yeah, no, I think I this. think this is this yeah. is a massive game changer. Partly yeah. because it's built on Java. Yes. So so having having the power of the Java ecosystem at your disposal is phenomenal. I mean, I, I've Why got. Why is our audience so quiet? Why is the audience so quiet? Well, half of them I'm are probably ask... negotiated. I'm, no, I'm, they're I'm still out of online. There's, there's, we've got, we've gained an attendee. So, um, but they're all quiet. No questions. Um, nobody's putting up their hand. There was one person yes, who said they couldn't hear, but the other people said they could. I've, I've got, I've got, I've got one oh. question. Yeah, you know, I, I just. Oh, you do. Oh, there's one that just came up from the demo. Yeah. It looked like the state is defined within the composable. So. Um, did you have any issues with event handling, push notifications? Well, I would imagine, um, because I mean, you would just inject that in, 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 in some way into your composable from it, outside it, and it, then it, reference it it. It. It, it. it depends on where it's defined and everything. Yes, but I mean, yes. sometimes you, you only need state locally yes. because, because it's only used locally. Yeah. But you can, also, you can also hoist the state out and have mm. it somewhere else. And well, I'm definitely it. going to um, take my um, my little state machine application that I did for Android, and then I'm oh, going yeah. I'm going to take it to Compose and see what that's like, and then I'm going to yeah. give it a spin on the desktop and see I'm, what that's like. I'm using something similar mm. to manage the transition between the different screens. So mm. I've got a little mm. bit of a state machine that a root view observes. Yes, and that yes. allows me to know when to switch what and what mm -hmm. variables to set mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. So, but, but just to come back to the question, I think the, the, the biggest paradigm shift is understanding when you want a refresh to happen because mm -hmm. that, is, that is where you need to put the state. Oh, yeah, of, course. of course. So, so you, need to, you need to think about what do you, you want to overdo do it. Or refreshes. Mm -hmm. it, it only redraws that little bit that needs mm -hmm. that state. But the tutorials do a phenomenal job of walking you through that and showing you the impact of putting state in different places. Yes. And it, it's, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to try to explain it because I might not do a good job. It's one of those things where you, you kind of built an intuitive feeling for it, mm -hmm. where it, it, as you, as you use it, you start to realize, mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. I actually that's want to have the state as close as possible to the thing that's going to depend on it because it just mm -hmm. makes more sense 
so that less of my screen gets re-rendered when that state changes. On Android, they've got really good debugging tools where you can see your oh, whole yes. screen refreshing and you realize that, oh, wait a minute, I'm redrawing half the screen when I'm literally just changing someone's status mm -hmm. from online to inactive. And that, that shouldn't be like that. I should move that state down so it only mm -hmm. affects that one column or that one row or something. I know why the audience is so quiet. I shared the link and it looks like they're all trying to build it locally and they're playing with it. Because oh. that's, that's some of the feedback I've got. So. I think the first time it runs, it downloads the whole internet. 